Thank you, thank you. The following is a, one of my voiceover demos. If uh, you're a voiceover artist and you would like to advertise one of your demos on my podcast, please send an MP3 to the drill12, all one word, at gmail.com. That's the drill12 at gmail.com. Back in a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Caesar's Palace for 12 rounds of boxing. In the red corner, from Los Angeles, California, wearing the red trunks with the gold trim, weighing in at 125 pounds, the lightweight champion of the world, Danny Little Red Lopez. Well, Bill, our winners get a home theater receiver. That's right. Experience the full potential of high-definition video with this 72-channel digital home theater receiver from Yamaha. But wait, that's not all. They also get a 5.1-channel surround sound system from Mirage. With five palm-sized speakers and a compact subwoofer cube, the MX-5.1 brings you huge immersive sound with Mirage's omnipolar technology. All from the Spiegel Catalog, Chicago, Illinois, 60609. And they're taking closer order as down the stretch they come. Mr. Hot Stuff has three lengths to make up with Chocolate Candy Last. On the rail, take the points behind that gallant sun with Chocolate Candy gaining on the outside. Side. In the lead is Pioneer of the Nile being tackled by Chocolate Candy. They're neck and neck as they come to the wire. And Pioneer of the Nile holds off Chocolate Candy and wins the Santa Anita Derby. And now, on your feet, time to greet holder of 14 NBA titles, your home team. Your Los Angeles Lakers, number three at 6'8", fifth year out of UCLA, playing forward Trevor Ariza. Starting at center, number 17 at seven feet, fourth year out of St. Andrews High School, Andrew Bynum. And at guard, number 24, 6'6", 13th season, out of Loyal Marion High School, Kobe Bryant. Okay, abortion, 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 folks. That's how many I paid for. Uh, I know abortion jokes are a little dicey, but I'm taking these babies to term. Uh, <laughs> Isn't it crazy that conservatives don't like abortion? You think conservatives would love abortion, right? It's just dead liberals. <laughs> We're not aborting farmers and electricians, dude. It's just piles of music theater majors. Like, what the fucking world you wanted? I don't understand. You ever drive around America? A lot of pro-life billboards in rural America. A lot of pro-life billboards where no one would ever want to be born. You know? <laughs> I want one honest billboard in the middle of nowhere that's like, did you know after 35 days in the womb, your fetus already has teeth, but their parents don't? Yeah. <laughs> that's why abortion always gets made illegal. There's pro-life billboards. There's no pro-abortion billboards. Why don't we get involved in the propaganda? That's why liberals lose at everything. We're such fucking pussies. We're not, we're not willing to fight dirty. We got to put up billboards to convince them to have abortions, you know? Put up, a, put up a billboard in the middle of West Virginia that's like, did you know that after 43 days in the womb, your fetus already thinks socialism's a good idea? <laughs> Better dead than red, right, brother? Good morning. It's Wednesday, Management Wednesday, September the 4th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the Serenity Prayer and the Patriotic Song of the Day, we will have headlines, patriotic shorts, 
Motivation, Bishop Barron, Ayn Rand, The 33 Strategies of War, and Management of the Absurd. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I should not change, the courage to change the things I should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you. And now, Varney and Company. Hey Maria, good morning everyone. This is the day after the big sell-off, and yes, the selling, some limited selling continues. We're going to start with NVIDIA. The value of that company dropped around $279 billion yesterday alone. The news is that the government has launched an antitrust investigation. NVIDIA's dominant position in AI is the problem. The stock's down again pre-market, down a buck at 106. We'll be looking for any bounce today. We're seeing more red ink across the board, actually. Tuesday, the Dow dropped 1.5%. Right now, it's down another 56 points. That's just a fraction of 1%. The S&P was down 2.1%, down again this morning, 16 points. The big losses came yesterday on the NASDAQ, down 3.3%, led by the MAG-7 stocks and semiconductors. It was a chip wreck, as they say. Uh, this morning... Pre-market, down another 100 points. That is about a half percentage point. So there's some selling. Yesterday's slide started with clear signs of a slowing economy. These days, bad news for the economy seems to be bad news for the market. Other markets, Bitcoin, for example, that's down to 56,000 bucks per coin. Interest rates staying well below 4% on the treasuries. The 10-year, though, the yield up a little to 3.83%. The two-year coming in at 38 8.6%. So again, the two-year yield just slightly above the 10-year. Look at the price of oil. A 
slowing economy here and in China cuts demand and the price is down to $70 a barrel. It was 69 a little earlier this morning. The steady decline in gas prices, well, that continues. There's good news. 331 for regular. And I should tell you that there are now nine states in the south where the price is below $3 a gallon. No change for diesel at 368. At 10 Eastern this morning, we get what's called the JOLTS report. That's the number of current job openings. That could move the market. And so could Friday's unemployment report. We'll see if bad news for the economy is bad news for the market. Let's get to politics. A big announcement today coming from Kamala Harris. She wants up to $50,000 in tax credits for small business startups. Donald Trump currently leads in the polls on the economy. Harris wants to reverse that with her opportunity economy. We'll hear from Trump tonight when he sits down with Sean Hannity, 9 p.m. Eastern on Fox News. On the show today, the pro-Hamas crowd returns to college campuses. At Columbia, Jewish students have been harassed, buildings defaced. This is not like the campus turmoil of the 1960s when the Vietnam War was the issue. In 2024, it is anti-Semitism writ large. It's Wednesday, September 14th, 2024. Varney and Company is about to begin. And that was Barney and Company, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Cabanas Veljas Beach.
was the waves on Cabanas Veljas Beach. Back in a minute. Thank you, and now, Patriotic Shorts. At six foot four and nearly 300 pounds, he was considered too big for combat, according to Army regulations. But college football standout Dan Blocker insisted on going to the front lines of Korea with his unit. It was at the Battle of Pork Chop Hill where Blocker took shrapnel while protecting three soldiers, sustaining serious wounds for which he received a Purple Heart. Danny was 300 pounds, and 290 of it was heart, said one of the men he saved. Upon returning stateside, Blocker decided to give acting a try at the suggestion of a soldier he met while in Korea. Danny, you should be in Westerns, said the friend, who happened to be a struggling actor himself, James Garner. Garner would get his big break a few years later, starring in the TV show Maverick, and he made it a point to cast his old friend in an episode. Blocker's performance on Maverick led to a starring role on Bonanza, one of television's most iconic shows. Dan was the beating heart of Bonanza, said co-star Michael Landon. He left us way too soon. And that was the Patriotic Shorts. Back in a minute. Thank you. Now a little bit of motivation. No matter how good you are, no matter how fast you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how strong you are, there is always someone out there who will be bigger, faster, smarter, or stronger. So what do you do? You can't always control who or what you're up against, but you can always control your effort. You must outwork every single one of those people you're competing with. When you find yourself up against other people and see yourself falling behind, are you the person who gives up and gives in? Are you the person who starts making excuses for why you're not doing as much as you could? Are you the person who finds it a reason to start doing things you're not supposed to? Taking breaks? Slacking off? Sleeping in? Eating like crap? Or are you the one who sees opportunity? The opportunity to get ahead of everyone else. The opportunity to work harder and perform better when it's game time. The opportunity to improve yourself and hold yourself accountable to what you know you can achieve if you really tried your hardest. In the shadows and darkness, when most people are still in bed or have gone home already, where you fight to become the best version of yourself every damn day. It's that process of pushing yourself to perform better. That's what stretches you to reach higher and higher levels. You don't become number one by taking it easy. You become number one by pushing yourself to the outer limits of your capabilities. It's these quiet, unseen moments that legends are made. You're not there to participate. You're there to fucking dominate. You gotta refuse to accept that you are what you are and that what your life is like now is what you're doomed to be forever. No, you fight. You scratch and claw every day to improve. Just a little bit. Weeding out all those weaknesses you have sneaking around in your brain. You weed those out with discipline, forcing yourself to execute on your mission for the day. Doing those hard things you have resistance from doing. And as you shut down those weaknesses, as you continue to prune out all the fickle feelings of laziness, you are literally building mental strength. You become tougher through completion. When you get hard stuff done, it builds your belief in your vision. It builds belief in your company. It builds belief in your ideas. It builds belief in yourself. So while most people are sitting around waiting for change, making all these amazing plans for how to revolutionize their lives and become better, you get your ass up and get to fucking work. Plans don't change people. Action changes people. So make movement. Move forward every day of your life. If they make 10 sales, you make 20. If they work 8 hours, you work 10. 
Whatever they do, I need you to do just a little more. Because when you add up all those extra bits of effort, day after day after day, that's going to make the difference between winning and losing. When others start slacking off, making excuses, you see a golden opportunity. It's your chance to double down, to push harder when everyone else is easing up. Every setback, every obstacle is a chance to show what you're made of. It's a chance to toughen up, to hone your skills, to rise above the bullshit. You might not control the raw talent, but you sure as hell control the effort. It's about grinding harder, pushing further, sweating more. It's about turning every damn ounce of your being into a relentless pursuit of excellence. You become the fucking nightmare of everyone in your field because while they're resting on their laurels, you're out there, grinding, improving, outworking every single one of them. You don't just aim to keep up. You aim to leave them all in your fucking dust. I'm dominate. When I die, you ain't gonna forget my name. I dominate this doggone thing. I dominate. Where I go, stuff happen. I dominate. If you gonna win, you just can't play this game because there are other teams that want to do exactly what you gotta do. So what you gotta do in practice is dominate in practice. Some of y'all, that's your problem. You think that you can dominate when the lights come on. If you can't dominate in practice, you can't dominate when the lights come on. I get up every morning at 3 o'clock. I dominate at 3 o'clock in the morning. I dominate when everybody sleep. I dominate at 4 in the morning, 6 in the morning. Why? Because y'all just getting up. I dominate in the dark. I dominate when nobody sees me. Because you just got to get there before the genius get there. They ain't waking up to 8. So if you get up at 3, you ain't got to be smarter than them. You just got to be quicker than them. You just got to be faster than them. You just got to get to the spot before they get to the spots. You ain't got to be them. You ain't got to be on their level. You don't have to be as smart. You don't have to become them. You can stay you, but you got to get there before they get there if you're going to stay you. Are we the underdogs? Good. That's where legends rise. They overlook us, we overperform. They doubt us, we outdo. We keep moving, we keep pushing, unstoppable. Let's call our names right here and right now. I guarantee you, when I line up and they line up, I want what all other men want. But when the challenge hits, when the opposition hits, when the pain creeps in, when the uncertainty creeps in, when the cuts, when the scars, when the bruises come, I just want it a little bit more than they want it. And if you ain't got more heart than me, if you ain't been working harder than me, if you ain't sacrificed more than me, I'm going to destroy you. And so that's how I conquer, and that's how nobody has ever beaten me yet. Like when you work for something, it gives you a different type of attachment to it. I need you to eat, sleep, breathe, dominate. We're not playing to the level of our competition no more. You're going to look at film in a way that they don't look at film. You're going to practice in a way they don't practice. Listening to coach, paying attention, being locked in and focused. Everything you do is going to be in a way that nobody else does. You can't win it if you can't see it. You got to see each one. You got to see yourself winning in practice. You got to see yourself winning the game. The championship, you got to see yourself. Wake up every single day. I was here before I was here. I was in this spot right here. I was talking from right here. I envisioned it. I saw it already. I see it before it happens. Discipline means that you dominate when you feel like it and you dominate when you don't feel like it. What do you do when somebody's not there watching you? What do you do when you have to either do what it is you know you're supposed to do without somebody there to supervise you or you get to take the playoff because no one's going to know the difference? Those are the things that make up success, and that's discipline. You have to do the things that you don't feel like doing because you know it needs to be fucking done. Train hard. Push limits, learn every single day. That's our backbone. That's our hustle. This is our turn. Our unwavering will. Every tackle, every move is for something bigger. Discipline is you do it so long and so hard and you're so passionate about it that even when you don't feel like it, you still operate at the highest level. Embrace the process, trust the process, but most importantly, you got to respect the process. Talent would never supersede it. If we respect it the way we say we respect it, if we love it the way we say we love it, if we cherish it the way we say we cherish it, every single day should be nothing less than excellence. You might not always be your best, but you can always bring me your best. It's about outworking, outlasting, and outperforming. Not just others, but your past self. It's about the relentless pursuit of excellence, the unyielding discipline, and the unstoppable force of taking action every single day. Download this video. And that was a little bit of motivation. Back in a minute.
Thank you. And now, the Daily Stoic. The smoke and dust of myth. Keep a list before your mind of those who burned with anger and resentment about something. Of even the most renowned for success, misfortune, evil deeds, or any special distinction. Then ask yourself, how did that work out? Smoke and dust, the stuff of simple myth trying to be legend. Marcus Aurelius, Meditations, 12.27 In Marcus Aurelius's writings, he constantly points out how the emperors who came before him were barely remembered just a few years later. To him, this was a reminder that no matter how much he conquered, no matter how much he inflicted his will on the world, it would be like building a castle in the sand, soon to be erased by the winds of time. The same goes for those driven to the heights of hate or anger or obsession or perfectionism. Marcus liked to point out that Alexander the Great, one of the most passionate and ambitious men who ever lived, was buried in the same ground as his mule driver. Eventually, all of us will pass away and slowly be forgotten. We should enjoy this brief time we have on earth, not be enslaved to emotions that make us miserable and dissatisfied. And that was the Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday. Back in a minute. Thank you. And now, Bishop Robert Barron. The hybrid quality of a human being is key to a lot of our poetry and a lot of our drama and a lot of the tension and beauty of being human. We're both physical and spiritual. We're like animals and we're like angels. We're very much of the earth and, and we're like other animals. That's now coming from the dust of the earth, as Genesis puts it, in not scientific language, but poetic language, but making much the same point that we do. We're of the earth. Good. And we should never forget that. But at the same time, we're more than animals. There's a qualitative difference between even the highest of the animals who are simply of the earth and us who are of the earth. But we also have, and here's that lovely idea, the Ruach Adonai, the breath of the Lord, breathing into us what? What makes us distinctively human. This is our, our mind, our wills, our freedom, our properly spiritual capacity. So Genesis says it here in poetic language of God breathing into us and then we become, we earthly animal things become a, a living being. And that was Bishop Robert Barron. Back in a minute. Thank you. And now, the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Quote, The exponents of modern movements do not seek to convert you to their values. They haven't any, but to destroy yours. Nihilism and destruction are almost explicit goals of today's trends. And the horror is that these trends move on unopposed. What is the solution and the antidote? Its name is Objectivism, unquote. Ayn Rand, our cultural value deprivation from the book The Voice of Reason. I just wanted to comment and say that where she says its name is Objectivism, no, its name is Objectivity. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the 33 Strategies of War. There are two kinds of passive aggression. The first is conscious strategy, as practiced by Metternich. The second is a semi-conscious or even unconscious behavior that people use all the time in the petty and not-so-petty matters of daily life. You may be tempted to forgive this second passive-aggressive type, who seems unaware of the effects of his or her actions, or helpless to stop, but people often understand what they are doing far better than you imagine, and you are more than likely being taken in by their friendly and helpless exterior. We are generally too lenient with this second variety. The key to using passive aggression as a conscious, positive strategy is the front you present to your enemies. 
They must never be able to detect the sullen, defiant thoughts that are going on inside of you. And that was the 33 Strategies of War. Back in a minute. Thank you. So you may as well, if you're a Democrat, you may as well vote Republican. And the reason is because you're not being given any option. Uh, Kamala Harris is becoming more of a Republican than a Democrat. She's not uh, providing clear uh, difference from the Republicans. She keeps co-opting the ideas that Donald Trump has come up with first. So as Harry Truman once said, if you give the people a choice between voting Republican and voting Republican, they'll vote Republican every time. Back in a minute. Thank you. Uh, Apparently there's been a school shooting in Georgia, and um, I don't have a lot of details on it other than there's a 14-year-old boy in custody that's going to be charged as an adult and charged with murder. So as far as commentary and analysis, I think out of respect for the victims and their families, I'll leave that until uh, several days from now, maybe a week or so. But um, if I have any news or new information, then I will provide it. Back in a minute. Thank you. Now, Chapter 14 from Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, by Michael Knowles. Chapter 14. Locking down dissent. Lab coats do not confer a special immunity from politics. The experts at the New England Journal of Medicine demonstrated this scientific fact in late 2020 when they declared, sex designations on birth certificates offer no clinical utility and they can be harmful for intersex and transgender people. It does not take a doctorate to know that sexual difference matters a great deal in medicine. The wokest obstetrician in the world will struggle to treat a trans woman. These experts lend credibility to the politically correct regime, not by furnishing it with facts, but by redefining scientific terms to better accord with the dictates of progress. Gender ideology offers perhaps the clearest example of science's perversion by political correctness, but scientific disciplines as far afield as epidemiology and meteorology have succumbed to radical redefinition as well, as the World Health Organization demonstrated during the coronavirus epidemic of 2020. While leftist politicians promoted a policy of lockdowns to fight the virus, some conservatives proposed an alternative strategy, herd immunity. Lockdowns entailed shuttering businesses, prohibiting social gatherings, and curtailing civil liberties. Many conservatives considered this sort of treatment more dangerous than the disease, particularly given the dearth of evidence that lockdowns offered any advantage over less severe measures. Better to institute prudent precautions to protect those most vulnerable to the virus, these conservatives argued, while pursuing a broader strategy of attaining herd immunity, which the World Health Organization had defined as the indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens when a population is immune, either through vaccination or immunity developed through previous infection. The WHO validated the role of herd immunity in suppressing the coronavirus by noting in the spring of 2020 that the threshold for establishing herd immunity for COVID-19 is not yet clear. But calls for more modest regulations in pursuit of herd immunity threatened the radicals' plans for cultural transformation, which benefited from the massive transfer of wealth and power brought about by the lockdowns. So by late November, the World Health Organization simply changed the definition of the key medical term. Herd immunity, the WHO now insisted, is a concept used for vaccination in which a population can be protected from a certain virus if a threshold of vaccination is reached. Not only did the WHO erase its references to infection, it went further to claim that herd immunity is achieved by protecting people from a virus, not by exposing them to it. The public health organization neglected to mention what groundbreaking discovery had led them to redefine the longstanding epidemiological concept because the shift had been semantic rather than scientific. 
Conservative skeptics of these experts noted the change, and the WHO failed to muster any scientific explanation to justify it. So in the final days of 2020, the World Health Organization undiscovered its new conception of herd immunity, which it redefined once more as the indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens when a population is immune either through vaccination or immunity developed through previous infection. But this time, the public health organization included political advice, noting that WHO supports achieving herd immunity through vaccination and that herd immunity against COVID-19 should be achieved by protecting people through vaccination, not by exposing them to the pathogen that causes the disease. The word should reveals much about the relationship between science and political correctness. The WHO had attempted to enshrine its new politically correct definition of herd immunity as scientific fact and therefore beyond the realm of legitimate political debate. When that transparent effort failed, the WHO admitted the true meaning of the term, but nonetheless encouraged compliance with draconian lockdowns that would endure at least until most of the population had received the vaccine, whether herd immunity had been achieved or not. The scientific reasoning changed but the political endgame always remained the same. Left-wing politicians defended their draconian lockdown policies and suppression of conservative dissent for several months by appealing to the supposedly nonpartisan experts, according to whom science demanded the closure of churches and businesses, as well as the suspension of civil rights. But as May rolled around, leftists themselves began to break the lockdown, along with glass storefronts, over alleged police brutality in the death of George Floyd. Black Lives Matter, an explicitly Marxist organization, led the riots, which soon spread throughout the country and even into Europe. Suddenly, the politicians lost interest in public health. Many left-wing politicians encouraged the riots, even as they excoriated conservatives for protesting the lockdowns. Some liberal politicians even joined in the protests themselves. For months, politicians had prohibited Americans from holding funerals for their loved ones, many of whom had to perish alone because of the public health policies. Yet those same politicians permitted thousands of mourners and activists to attend Floyd's funeral, pandemic or not. The political circumstances of a career criminal's death entitled him to a quasi-state funeral, attended and addressed by future President Joe Biden. Meanwhile, cynical politicians prohibited any fanfare for countless ordinary Americans, whose deaths lacked political significance in their eyes. Liberal politicians castigated conservatives for peacefully protesting the lockdowns, but they encouraged nationwide riots and looting in the name of social justice. If the administrative state functioned as progressives promised, nonpartisan scientific experts would have chided the hypocritical politicians and reminded everyone left, right, and center to stay home for the good of public health. Instead, in early June, more than 1,200 health care experts signed a letter that simultaneously condemned conservative protests and endorsed BLM riots. Inexpert observers might observe that viruses spread just as quickly through liberal gatherings as through conservative ones, but the experts contested this common sense. On April 30th, heavily armed and predominantly white protesters entered the state capitol building in Lansing, Michigan, protesting stay-home orders and calls for widespread public masking to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Infectious disease physicians and public health officials publicly condemned these actions and privately mourned the widening rift between leaders in science and a subset of the communities that they serve. As of May 30th, we are witnessing continuing demonstrations in response to ongoing, pervasive, and lethal institutional racism set off by the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, among many other black lives taken by police. A public health response to these demonstrations is also warranted, but this message must be wholly different from the response to white protesters resisting stay-at-home orders. More than 120 words into their letter, the scientists had not made a single scientific claim. Instead, they asserted the political point that black leftists ought to enjoy greater civil liberty than white conservatives. They even implied black racial superiority through the persistent capitalization of black and lowercasing of white. The rest of the letter parroted similarly politically correct claptrap. In the entire 990-word letter, the scientists made only one scientific argument. 
White supremacy is a lethal public health issue that predates and contributes to COVID-19, they claimed. Leaving aside the supposed medical consequences of white supremacy, the social fact that whites uniquely may be castigated on the basis of their race would seem to contradict America's alleged white supremacy. The scientists exploited their academic credentials to make their unrelated political claims appear scientific and therefore beyond the realm of legitimate debate. A tactic employed not just by the quacks who signed the letter, but even by the most respected scientists in the country. In the early days of the epidemic, Dr. Anthony Fauci had one clear message for the public. Stop wearing masks. There's no reason to be walking around with a mask, he insisted in March 2020. When you're in the middle of an outbreak, wearing a mask might make people feel a little bit better, and it might even block a droplet, but it's not providing the perfect protection that people think it is. Further, according to Fauci, masking did not just fail to stop the spread of the virus, it actively damaged public health. Often, there are unintended consequences, he warned. People keep fiddling with the mask, and they keep touching their face. Fauci had led the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases since 1984. He had worked with the broader National Institutes of Health for more than 50 years and advised every U.S. president since Ronald Reagan. In 2008, President George W. Bush awarded him the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. According to the Institute for Scientific Information, from 1983 to 2002, Dr. Fauci was the 13th most cited scientist in the world, across all disciplines among nearly 3 million authors. When Dr. Fauci told the nation not to wear masks, the people listened. Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell parroted Fauci's line, as did Surgeon General Jerome Adams, who dispensed the medical advice with greatest urgency. Seriously, people, stop buying masks, Adams insisted. They are not effective in preventing general public from catching hashtag coronavirus. But if healthcare providers can't get them to care for sick patients, it puts them and our communities at risk. Then, a month later, they all changed their minds. On April 3rd, the Surgeon General recommended wearing cloth face coverings in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain, grocery stores, pharmacies, etc., especially in areas of significant community-based transmission. He defended his change of heart as data-driven and promised to continue to update our response and guidance based on the data. Swalwell, too, reversed course, as did Dr. Fauci. There should be universal wearing of masks, Fauci told ABC News. But the science and data that Fauci and the others invoked to justify their reversal had not changed much over the intervening weeks. Indeed, the CDC had published a paper in May declaring that 14 randomized controlled trials of cloth masks did not support a substantial effect on transmission of viruses. And even many months later, studies raised serious doubts about the efficacy of masks in preventing coronavirus infection. We may leave it to other books to debate the medical merits of the 2020 public health response. It suffices for our purposes to understand the politics. Although public health experts such as Dr. Fauci insisted that ever-changing data prompted the cloth mask flip-flop, he later admitted in an interview with the Washington Post that the source of the change lay in political rather than scientific considerations. Back then, the critical issue was to save the masks for the people who really needed them because it was felt that there was a shortage of masks, he admitted. In other words... The public health officials believed masks did offer protection against the virus. Fauci had lied when he told the public in March that there was no reason to be walking around with a mask. Fauci just felt that certain people, namely his colleagues in the medical field, deserved more protection against the virus than others. So he discouraged the use of masks until he knew they could secure enough supplies for hospital workers. Fauci defended his misdirection on masks primarily on the grounds that it freed up more protective equipment for hospital workers, a political rather than scientific consideration. He misrepresented what he believed to be the scientific facts in order to effect his preferred political ends, and all the while, he denied that politics influenced his advice. For goodness sakes, I've never had any political ideology that I've made public the exasperated epidemiologist told Daily Show host Trevor Noah in September. 
I'm really just talking to you about public health. When I'm telling you wear a mask, keep social distancing, avoid crowds, wash your hands, do things outdoors more than indoors, there's nothing political about that, he insisted. That's a public health message that we know works. With that guarantee, Dr. Fauci revealed that he knew even less about politics than he did about masks. By definition, public health involves both science and politics. The word public means political, as politics is simply the way we all get along together in public rather than private life. Fauci receives his paycheck from a governmental agency. He has reported to politicians up to and including the President of the United States. His job entails mandating how hundreds of millions of people behave, all the way down to the minutiae of how they dress and celebrate holidays. Few people in American history have ever possessed such political power. But Fauci shares the progressive understanding of politics, which trades democratic deliberation for scientific expertise and redefines political decision-making as science. According to this view, citizens no longer have the right to debate eternal questions and persuade their fellow countrymen. Instead, science has progressed to the point that data and expertise can solve those stubborn problems once and for all. The scientists know what works. But in order for something to work, it must have a purpose. A lawnmower works when it cuts grass. A lock works when it prevents intruders from getting in. Neither can work unless someone first determines that we ought to cut the grass or keep out intruders. Likewise, public policy can only work when it achieves predetermined goals. According to the old constitutional standard, we the people have the right and responsibility to determine those goals through deliberation and persuasion. According to the new progressive standard, we the people have the obligation to defer to scientific experts who dictate not merely how to achieve specific policy goals, but often which goals to pursue in the first place. When CNN asked Democratic Senate candidate John Ossoff to articulate his vision for public health in December of 2020, he robotically replied, I think we should follow the expertise of public health experts. To Ossoff's credit, he took the progressive approach to its logical conclusion and even admitted that he himself had nothing to add to the discussion beyond regurgitating the whims of technocrats in lab coats. Politicians need to recognize the limits of our own knowledge and wisdom, he demanded. Epidemiologists who dedicate their careers and their training to studying the spread of infectious disease are qualified to advise us on the correct mitigation procedures. And the problem we've had all year is that politicians have been suppressing and ignoring public health advice. Never mind that politicians had already outsourced public policy to the whims of epidemiologists for a full nine months at that point. It's time to trust the experts, Ossoff concluded. But which experts do we trust, and what sort of expertise should they possess? Ossoff advocated that we trust epidemiologists, and even then only those epidemiologists who supported draconian lockdown measures. But experts exist in every field. One imagines 2020 would have played out rather differently had politicians deferred to economic or military experts rather than epidemiological experts, and the country might well have been the better for it. Pandemics do not put other political concerns on pause. While America followed the advice of public health experts, the nation's international adversaries took advantage for economic and military gain. Experts in public health, national security, and economics – to say nothing of constitutional law, criminal justice, political philosophy, and any other number of fields, may all have disagreed with one another over how to handle the pandemic. We elect politicians to consider all of these various concerns and to exercise their judgment in forming public policy among competing priorities. Politicians are supposed to be expert at politics. We, the people, express our trust in these experts at the ballot box, and when they fail us, we put our trust in other politicians. The United States has endured countless epidemics, from smallpox in the 17th and 18th centuries to cholera in the 19th century to the Spanish and Hong Kong flus in the 20th century. Not one of those epidemics prompted politicians to shut down the country as they did for the Chinese coronavirus, even though that virus was by no means the most virulent the country had ever faced. The nature of death and disease did not change between then and now. 
But the standards by which people judge death, disease, and politics did change. And this new standard demanded deference to progressive technocrats, whose words carried the authority of science itself. The left's abuse of scientific credentials to affect political ends long predates the coronavirus pandemic, going back at least to the earliest days of global warming, then known as global cooling. Get a good grip on your long johns, cold weather haters. The worst may be yet to come, warned the Washington Post in a front page report titled Colder Winters Held Dawn of New Ice Age on January 11, 1970. That's the long, long range weather forecast being given out by climatologists, the people who study very long term world weather trends. The Post saw fit to surround the word climatologists in quotation marks because so few readers would have recognized the emerging field in the 1970s. Half a century later, as climatologists have exerted more and more influence in public life, that particular breed of expert may enjoy greater recognition than any other, reflecting a shift not merely in scientific research, but also in politics. Science, another ice age? Asked Time magazine on November 13, 1972. Newsweek covered... The Cooling World on April 28, 1975. Other outlets joined the frenzy. Global warming alarmists sometimes dismiss the global cooling scare as a media contrivance at odds with the scientific views at the time. But one need only read Newsweek's reporting on the subject to dismiss the dismissal. Quoting several prominent scientists, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and National Academy of Sciences Newsweek painted a bleak picture of Earth's future. Meteorologists disagree about the cause and extent of the cooling trend, as well as over its specific impact on local weather conditions, the magazine admitted. But they are almost unanimous in the view that the trend will reduce agricultural productivity for the rest of the century. If the climatic change is as profound as some of the pessimists fear, the resulting famines could be catastrophic. Four decades later, Malnourishment hit an all-time low, even as the world population doubled. The mistaken scientists made political demands along with their scientific predictions. Climatologists are pessimistic that political leaders will take any positive action to compensate for the climatic change, or even to allay its effects, Newsweek reported. The scientists proposed stockpiling food and introducing the variables of climatic uncertainty into economic projections of future food supplies, as well as more ambitious solutions, such as melting the Arctic ice cap by covering it with black soot, which would have proved an awkward fix decades later when scientists reversed their judgment and identified melting ice caps themselves as an irrefutable harbinger of the end times. Fortunately, citizens of the 1970s had the good sense to ignore the scientists' hysterical warnings, which sometimes differed over cause, but always foretold the same effects, famine and death. In addition to predictions of apocalyptically inclement weather, scientists of that era warned that overpopulation would strain the Earth's resources and cause mass starvation. The Stanford biologist Paul Ehrlich began his 1968 book, The Population Bomb, by declaring... The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. Lest any optimists hold out hope that agricultural advances might solve the impending famines, Ehrlich continued, At this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. The dead certain scientific expert explained that mankind had only one hope to preserve life. Stop it from occurring in the first place. We must have population control at home, hopefully through changes in our value system, but by compulsion if voluntary methods fail, Ehrlich demanded, decrying the cancer of population growth, which he insisted must be cut out. As a rule, people who describe newborn babies as a cancer tend to have a distorted vision of the world. But prominent leftists, whose vision had already been similarly distorted, lapped up Ehrlich's expertise. Johnny Carson invited him on The Tonight Show, after which the population bomb shot up the bestseller lists. India's leftist prime minister, Indira Gandhi, enforced policies that required sterilization in order to access water, electricity, ration cards, and medical care. 
Communist China embraced the one-child policy, which led to upwards of 100 million forced abortions and sterilizations. Despite these atrocities, the world population continued to grow, but world hunger declined. Ehrlich had been perfectly wrong. Not only had his doomsday prophecy failed to materialize, but the greatest cause of mass death in the subsequent decades was the coerced abortions that his book spurred. Yet Ehrlich never paid a price for his fatally false predictions. He continued to teach at Stanford. Prestigious institutions continued to laud him with honors. And Ehrlich remained unrepentant, never failing to warn of overpopulation as he continued his crusade against human life. Leftist radicals made use of Ehrlich in their zeal to promote contraception and abortion, both of which undermined the old moral standards. But their agenda never depended upon the accuracy of his scientific views. The expert turned out to be scientifically wrong, but he was always politically correct. Left-wing billionaires such as Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Oprah Winfrey, George Soros, and Mike Bloomberg continued to promote fears of overpopulation, describing the imaginary scourge as the world's most pressing problem during a secret meeting that leaked to the press in 2009. As the irrefutable scientific fact of global cooling morphed into the irrefutable scientific fact of global warming during the 1980s and 90s, left-wing politicians incorporated Ehrlich's Malthusian musings into their new doomsday theory. In his 1992 book, Earth in the Balance, Senator Al Gore asserted, No goal is more crucial to healing the global environment than stabilizing human population. In 1997, Vice President Gore repeated this claim during a White House conference on global warming. While industrialized nations had stabilized their birth rates, Gore contended, through contraceptives and abortion, poorer countries in Africa and Asia had continued to have babies at unacceptably high rates. So Gore proposed a global Marshall Plan to kill those poor brown babies in the womb through abortion and to prevent their conception in the first place by subsidizing contraceptives in poor countries. Al Gore continued to promote population control into the 20-teens. During a speech to a New York audience in 2011, Gore disguised his advocacy of aborting African babies as fertility management and educating and empowering girls and women. But even the liberal Los Angeles Times admitted that these euphemisms served only to make the touchy topic of population control more palatable. In 2019, during his second bid for president, Democratic Senator Bernie Sanders called for similar measures in poor countries. Empowering women and educating everyone on the need to curb population growth seems a reasonable campaign to enact, claimed an audience member at CNN's Climate Change Town Hall. Would you be courageous enough to discuss this issue and make it a key feature of a plan to address climate catastrophe, she asked, introducing a new degree of hysteria to the allegedly scientific issue that began as global cooling, before reversing into global warming, then morphing into climate change, and finally attaining the dramatic epithet, catastrophe. The answer is yes, affirmed Bernie, who had already endorsed the Green New Deal, GND, a $93 trillion proposal by socialist politician Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to upend American society in the name of saving the planet. Ocasio-Cortez used apocalyptic environmental theories to justify the legislation, but her plan extended far beyond environmental measures. In a Green New Deal fact sheet, AOC explained that the GND would guarantee the right to a job with a family-sustaining wage, family and medical leave, vacations, and retirement security, high-quality education, including higher education and trade schools, healthy food, high-quality health care, safe, affordable, adequate housing, and economic security for all who are unable or unwilling to work. The freshman congressman soon removed the outline from her website, recognizing perhaps that a guaranteed income for deadbeats might not play in Peoria. But the formal House resolution on the Green New Deal did not significantly depart from the deleted FAQ page. It preserved universal entitlements to high-quality health care, affordable, safe, and adequate housing, and economic security as well as revolutionary plans to upgrade all existing buildings in the United States. It promised to promote justice and equity by stopping current, preventing future, and repairing historic oppression of indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, 
the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused, and other allegedly aggrieved groups without ever specifying how these people had been oppressed and what exactly their oppression had to do with global warming or global cooling, climate change, climate catastrophe, or whichever jargon the radicals preferred that week. No matter what the latest science is, and however much it may contradict the previous science, it seems always to require that we breed less, eat less, move less, and dispute less. We must always do the opposite of whatever we have done in the past. The Earth may be heating up or cooling down or deceitfully appearing to stay the same, but whatever the weather, the radicals demand we cede more control to experts, provided, of course, that those experts tow the party line. The sudden popularity of the phrase scientific consensus shows how thoroughly political correctness has inverted intellectual life. The phrase rarely, if ever, appeared in literature, scientific or otherwise, before the 1970s. After a brief dip in popularity during the Reagan era, it skyrocketed in use during the 1990s and 2000s. The new phrase reflected a new, politically correct understanding of both politics and science. Politics, once conducted through Republican government and consensus, increasingly outsourced rule to purportedly apolitical experts. Meanwhile, scientific inquiry once undertaken by clinical experts, began to rely on popular support for legitimacy. For decades, alarmists have defended their prophecies of Earth's imminent destruction by noting that 97% of scientists agree with their doomsday views. NASA makes this claim almost verbatim in the first sentence of an article titled Scientific Consensus, Earth's Climate is Warming. The space agency asserts, Multiple studies published in peer-reviewed scientific journals show that 97% or more of actively publishing climate scientists agree. Climate warming trends over the past century are extremely likely due to human activities. As the conservative Heartland Institute observed in its 2015 analysis, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming, NASA cited four surveys to arrive at the famous 97% figure. But a closer look at those reports reveals that the alleged consensus rests on shaky scientific ground. The space agency cites historian Naomi Oreskes, who in turn cites abstracts of scientific papers, many of which either begin with the premise of catastrophic man-made global warming or else mention it only in passing. NASA then cites John Cook, a professor of cognitive science better known for his blogs than his scholarly publications, who claims to have discovered 97.1% agreement on catastrophic warming among scientists. But a paper published in Science and Education debunked that statistic, finding instead that just 1% of papers addressing that issue and 0.3% of papers consulted overall endorsed that hypothesis. A third study by Maggie Zimmerman consisted of a two-minute online survey sent to 10,000 random scientists, 3,000 of whom responded. Zimmerman ignored responses from scientists whose fields of study might lead them to conclude that the sun, rather than industry, had caused the warming. A fourth study, from William Anderegg, presumes that all scientists who had not explicitly refuted the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had thereby endorsed the body's extreme conclusions. Regardless of how and why the mercury in the thermometer rises or falls, alarmist and skeptic alike must admit the political nature of the debate— which from the beginning has revolved around appeals to popular consensus by governmental bodies who always seem to reach the same policy conclusions no matter what the data show. Conservatives have generally attempted to refute their opponents' pseudoscientific arguments on scientific grounds. When leftists base their power grabs on supposedly catastrophic global warming, conservatives contest the temperature. When the radicals rely on the China virus to justify their political demands, conservatives debate the lethality of the epidemic and the effectiveness of the recommended health measures. But while the left's dubious scientific claims may indeed merit such skepticism, conservatives give away the game when they quibble over scientific data, an approach that grants their opponents even more dubious political premises. When conservatives attack the Green New Deal on the grounds that the Earth hasn't really gotten warmer, they tacitly accept the notion that warming would warrant the radical plan. By disparaging coronavirus lockdowns on the grounds that 99.7% of people infected with the virus survive, 
they grant that a lower rate of survival would merit the unprecedented upheaval of our political system. Even after decades of politically correct chicanery, there remains an alternative to this lose-lose scenario, the defense of the traditional order. Perhaps warmer weather threatens civilization. Perhaps it does not. Maybe the coronavirus poses an unprecedented threat to human life. Maybe not. In any event, doctor dictators and expert technocrats have no right to demand that we acquiesce to their every whim. A free people may welcome the advice of specialists, but we must also consider other non-scientific factors, including the effects of a given policy on the economy, national security, popular culture, civil rights, social relations, and myriad other facets of our republic. Even if climate change really could destroy the world by 2031, as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez claims, or even by 2021, as Britain's Prince Charles has claimed, science remains the handmaiden of philosophy. And in a free republic, the people must set the nation's course. The radicals of the 1960s did not demand deference to the proclamations of established experts. On the contrary, they attempted to undermine the authority of the establishment by questioning all received opinion. As the arch-hippie Timothy Leary put it, think for yourself and question authority. From the 1920s through the 1980s, radicals questioned and thereby subverted virtually every established standard in religion, sex, education, behavior, dress, and politics, primarily through new standards of speech. During those decades of radical progress, conservatives failed to defend established authority, and many did not even try, preferring the new culture of openness to the old rigidities. By the 20-teens, the new anti-standard of political correctness had pervaded all aspects of life. Even the allegedly apolitical field of scientific research could not resist the new, politically correct rules. Cultural revolutionaries had brought to heel science itself, which they subsequently invoked to legitimize their ideological claims. A movement that undertook the ruthless criticism of all that exists had turned even established authority to its own ends. The radicals had not only undermined the old order, they had replaced it. And that was the end of Chapter 14, Locking Down Dissent, from Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds, by Michael Knowles. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, from Management of the Absurd, Chapter 22, Everything We Try Works and Nothing Works. I've always been puzzled, and I suppose disturbed, by the fact that management consultants whose approaches I disdain and who I think are not well trained, or maybe even a shade unethical, seem to have more or less the same successes in their work as the consultants I most respect. That is, it seems to matter little what techniques or approaches are attempted. They all seem to work. When we put that observation together with the unsettling fact that any changes introduced by consultants will soon fade and disappear, leaving almost no trace of their having ever been instituted, we have an interesting paradox. It does seem that everything we try works, yet nothing works. It has been a matter of some embarrassment for psychologists to live with research results that show that all schools of therapy, even those fundamentally at odds with each other, produce essentially the same results. People get better in the same proportions, whether they are in psychoanalysis or hypnotherapy or any of what are now literally hundreds of other forms of treatment. But like management consulting, the effects are somehow illusory. It is very difficult to show lasting behavioral changes as a result of any of these approaches. Unaware of that phenomenon, a management consultant may claim to have discovered the right way to do things after inventing a technique that seems to be well received to be producing the desired effect the trouble is that it doesn't make any difference what the technique is they all work we see this most clearly in management training exercises especially in the techniques used to explore human relations there are now countless manuals crammed with such techniques i'm sure they all work i can even imagine the leader of a management training group just saying All right, 
I'm now going to turn off all the lights in the room so we cannot see each other as we continue to discuss the issues we are dealing with. At the end of the session, people would probably say that it was the best session they had experienced, that they had never gotten so much out of a conversation before. Consultants or managers who have instituted training programs can easily be misled by the reaction of the workforce. People will often say the most amazing, enthusiastic things about whatever method or technique they have been exposed to, especially if it has been something of an ordeal. It is not uncommon for them to say, This has changed my life. I'll never be the same again. It's the most marvelous thing that has happened to me. Not easy words to dismiss, especially if you want very much to hear them. No right way. Young managers become enthusiastic about new techniques because they have yet to learn that everything works and nothing works. That's why the worst charlatan and the most demented cult leader can have devoted followers and why every fad captures a certain number of managers, but it certainly presents a dilemma for the responsible manager who is genuinely trying to sort things out. Studies of management are rather confusing. There appears to be no right way to be a manager. Completely different types of leaders enjoy equal success, and part of the reason is that employees have the power to make their leaders look good. Organizations survive because most people are trying to do their best and will make Uh, an effort to keep things going under any circumstances, no matter what kind of leadership they're given. It has always puzzled researchers why a gruff, demanding autocrat could have roughly the same results as a gentle, sensitive, democratically oriented manager. Some suggest that whatever their management style, if it is an authentically theirs, if it is congruent with them personally, it will succeed. Others say the style is just an overlay on sound management principles, fairness, integrity, tenacity, feeling a genuine respect, and even affection for the group, going to bat for its members, holding out a vision for them, working hard, demonstrating a genuine commitment to the task and to the organization. That's why managers who may be good at starting things but not good at follow-through, or good at seeing the big picture but not able to attend to detail, all can be successful. Their employees often compensate for those differences and actually make the managers succeed. Easy come, easy go. If we look at the aftermath of some of our best-known management studies, we can find ample reason to doubt the seductive but deceptive idea that something is working. Tom Peters and Robert Waterman, in their best-selling book, In Search of Excellence, identified companies engaged in practices that had earned them excellent standing in the market. It was not long, however, before a number of these companies, which presumably were continuing their supposedly effective practices, ran into considerable difficulty and could no longer be considered excellent. The classic Hawthorne studies in the 1930s found that when people are paid attention to, and they believe that management's efforts are designed to help them, productivity will increase even in situations where one would expect it to decrease. The studies led to the installation of a program designed to pay more attention to workers at the Western Electric plant in Hawthorne, Illinois, site of the research. Years later, a frustrated F.J. Roethlisberger, one of the study's co-authors, told me, it's all gone. There's nothing left. As Roethlisberger explained it, everything he and his colleague Elton Mayo had undertaken eventually was abandoned. There was no trace of the program left. The Hawthorne study showed that it is relatively easy to produce changes in a limited experimental situation. Yet, as we have seen from the consequences of that very experiment, it doesn't take long for those changes to disappear. It takes practice. People can make lasting changes in themselves only through a commitment to a continuing discipline. For example, crash diets don't work, but a permanent modification of one's eating habits does. Visits to spas don't work after the rover, but the daily practice of exercising, stretching, or weightlifting does. The same is true in management. Lasting change comes only from the adoption of sound management principles that are practiced on a continuing basis. There are no quick fixes. And that was uh, chapter 22, Everything We Works and Nothing Works, from the book Management of the Absurd by Richard Farson. Back in a minute.
This is Ron, your host, the only uh, true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there, and reminding you that you are not neutral and that the government has no rights.